Okay, I think people are, are starting to arrive, so uh, let's start. So good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the virtual London School of Economics for uh, our event uh, entitled, uh, How Much Does Management Matter in an Era of Disruption? Um, we have competition from the, uh, the Labour Party manifesto this morning, but I'm glad uh, those of you who have got time have, uh, have joined us. Um, uh, my name is John Van Rienen. I am the um, director of uh, the Programme on Innovation and Diffusion, which is POID, here at the LSE, as well as the um, Ronald Coase uh, Chair of Economics. Um, well, I'm very excited to uh, uh, be able to uh, chair this event. Um, I should mention that we are funded, we're non-partisan, or we're funded by the ESRC and UKRI, who also have funded kindly um, the new wave of the work that will be will be presented uh, presented today. So before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping items that I want to cover. Um, the discussion is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast and video subject to no technical difficulties, which is uh, which is an important caveat here at the LSE. Um, we will have designated time towards the end of our panel um, for Q and A from the audience. So. Make sure you put your hands up and include your name and organizational affiliation before you start asking questions. Um, so let me uh, turn to welcoming our, uh, our panelists. Uh, we have two excellent presenters, um, uh, Daniela Skur, uh, who will be kicking off the event, um, talking around about 25 minutes. She's the uh, assistant professor in Cornell University in the United States at the Dyson School of Applied Economics. Um, I've known uh, Danny for many years. She actually started working on the World Management Survey back in 2011, and we've had many uh, fun times over the years, and I hope, I'm sure she'll be sharing some of those. Um, uh, she, uh, she did a PhD at Oxford. She did a postdoc at MIT. She has many articles in leading management and economic journals. So very much uh, looking forward to her presenting our report. And then we have a, dis uh, a, a discussion by Tara Alice, who I'm sure you're very familiar with. She is, uh, she she is a commander of the British Empire, which means as an officer of the British Empire, I have to respect what she says, as she is my commander with her CVE. Uh, she is also the Director of Research and Economics at McKinsey in the uh, UK office. Uh, she is the chair of the Productivity Institute's Advisory Committee, a trustee of the Royal Economic Society, an honorary professorship of the Alliance, uh, Manchester Business School, a fellow of the, of the Academy of Social Science, and a fellow of the Royal Society. So a very prominent and authoritative um, person in the economics and management world. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Danny. Uh, to kick us off, I'll, we'll have Danny for about 25 minutes, Tara for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have some, I'll lead some structured uh, discussion, and then we'll have a, a Q&A from the audience. So hold, hold your questions until then. So over to you, uh, Daniela. Great. Um, I'm assuming that we don't have any technical difficulties already, and everybody can see my screen and hear me. I certainly can. I think I think I think fabulous. <laughs> Good. Okay. So first of all, um, I, I can no longer see people joining, but I hope that people continue joining. And thank you all for um, uh, being with us today for the launch of our 2024 uh, World Management Survey report. Um, and thank you in advance for Tara for taking the time to discuss this. Uh, I'm really excited for, for the discussion later. Um, so I'm going to start with, for the next half hour, I'm going to focus on two main things. Um, first, We've been doing this for almost 20 years and we find that management still matters, you know? So I'll briefly go over um, what that one point means in, in a second, but in general, uh, one of the key finding, findings is that there's still, it's still the case that a higher management score in our, um, in our survey is linked with a bunch of uh, good outcomes for, for firms. Now, second, then this is the new bit. We find that management is important, um, especially when the world's a mess. And so this is a world cloud of uh, BBC headlines for the past uh, five months of the year. A lot of words here that means shocks like climate change driven sort of natural disasters, as well as um, messy events like elections um, and conflicts around the world. So 
Before I dive into the mess, though, uh, let me give folks a short primer on what the World Management Survey is um, and the basic findings from, from this work. Um, so first of all, uh, what is what is the WMS um, measuring management? So management has been notoriously difficult to measure um, over time, and the WMS was created to fill this gap. So this is a large project started about 20 years ago now this year. Uh, where we measure the adoption of basic management practices. And we do this via an interview with the senior most management manager at uh, the manufacturing plant. We talk to them about a set of core topics that we've covered over um, all these years, including things like lean operations, uh, performance management. So, you know, what kind of key performance indicators they use uh, to track the performance, how they discuss and keep track of that, um, deal with issues and so on. Talk about target setting. Um, so how do they come up with targets? You know, what are the targets based on? Um, and then people management. Uh, how do they deal with good performers, bad performers, and uh, sort of keeping talent and keep keeping and attracting talent um, to their firms? And now this latest, um, uh, sir, the, in, uh, the latest wave in 2002, uh, 22, we added climate change and supply chains um, to the topics to to our discussion to understand how managers are dealing with disruption. Um, and so over the past 20 years, we've collected almost 18,000 um, uh, data on 18,000 firms. Some of them we've interviewed multiple times over the years. So the, the actual data point is even more than, than 18,000, but it's at least 18,000 firms. Um, and as you can see, it's a global project, you know, 38 countries um, across the world in our manufacturing sample. And this is very much thanks to a wonderful team of people I'm very lucky to work with, both in um, our academic side and then also our excellent project managers. Uh, that I, I I suspect might even be on the call today. Uh, they keep keep things going. So, what do we measure? Um, so across those topics that I mentioned, you know, operations, performance monitoring, target setting, and people, we have a set of open ended questions. So this is very much a conversation, which means a lot of the managers really enjoy having these these chats. Um, and it's something like so. For example, one of the questions under our operations and performance monitoring is performance tracking. The question that the manager would uh, would hear is so how off how do you track performance in in the plant um, and then you know they'll they'll answer that question and then there might be some follow up questions like how frequently um, you know who gets to see the data um, and so on and then the the interviewer um, takes all of that information and scores the practice on a scale of one to five one being little to no formal management practices so some things are mostly ad hoc. Um, a three is formal practices in place with some weaknesses. Um, and then a five is sort of best practices, uh, part of the, the culture of the organization. Um, and then, so for the example here, non performance tracking, a one would mean, you know, things are not really measured, everything's very ad hoc. A three is when you have a set of key performance indicators in place, um, but only senior management get to see it. And then a five is, you know, performance is continuously tracked and communicated formally, informally, everybody gets to understand. It. Um, just to kind of fix some ideas of what that might mean, this is an example of best of, of what could be pre best practice, right? So you have boards that everybody can see and with the, all the main KPIs sort of in, in plain view that that's um, um, tracked. But this is also best practice, right? And this is just to say um, what we're trying to measure is more the practice itself rather than just having um, the screens and you know the, the, all of that uh, technology in place. If these are not updated, for example, that's not as good as something like this that would be updated more um, more regularly. Now, one thing, um, the um, original questionnaire here, the genesis of the survey tool was based on how uh, McKinsey assessed firms that they were working with, which is why having Tara here 20 years later is just uh, even, even more special. So um, good. So what have we found with this tool over the past 20 years? So I'll run through a few of the key findings we've had. Um, and they've kind of held up every time we've collected new data. So first of all, there's quite a lot of variation um, in terms of the average quality of these management practices across countries. Um, and this management quality has a very strong um, correlation with GDP per capita, right? So richer countries tend to have firms that have better management. Um, now, of course, this is, you know, it's only a correlation, but but it really does mirror a lot of the productivity differences that we see across countries. So. Um, you know, it's plausible to think that good management practices do have a very important role in the macro sort of country level productivity differences as well. Um, but even these regions that have very, very good management are sort of here at the top of the, on average, um, management quality, 
have a distribution in in terms of all the firms um, in in their region. So, um, you know, for example, Europe on average has fairly good management, but again, there's some that are some firms that are very well managed, and then some here at the bottom that that aren't. And this is also true, even you know, as we do within uh, within countries. So, um, I'll take here the example of the U.S. Uh, there's a um, even though the U.S. is one of the best average uh, quality of management in, in across uh, across all countries we have in our sample, um, there's a lot of firms that are very well managed. There's quite a, a large number of them between four and five, uh, and not a whole lot between one and two. Now, on the other hand, Brazil, um, most of the, uh, there's a lot of firms here on the bottom between uh, one and two, uh, but even though you know that. On average, Brazil is uh, lower than the U.S. There are still um, some firms in Brazil that do very well. Right? So there's quite a bit, um, a bit of variation, sort of even within country. Um, and again, we care about this because management matters for a bunch of outcomes that that we think are really important. Uh, we know that there's this strong correlation uh, at the firm level between uh, the quality of management and productivity. You know, and this is across a number of contexts. So this is. Um, a summary from a paper, a research paper we wrote in the um, Oxford Review of Economic Policy. Uh, I mean, the key result here is that all of these are positive, right? All of these relationships are positive. Um, and this is various contexts of different types of firms in productivity. Uh, but we also see this in schools. We also see this in hospitals and even in government. Right? So, you know, a, a, there's also a, a set of other outcomes that I don't have here, but, you know, we know that uh, management is correlated with better work-life balance um, and energy efficiency and other things like that that we care about. Um, now, I keep saying correlation because that's what we can see here, but there's also a lot of work that looked at whether we can say this is a causal relationship. So does better management cause better performance? Um, and, and, you know, indeed that's the case. I won't have time to go through all this other work in, in detail, but essentially um, two ways that, that folks have been able to do this is one, using historical events that provide some sort of shock that, um, you know, someone hand, ra randomly sets some firms to be better managed than others or get management training. Um, and then they find that the firms do better after the fact. So the important thing here is that you see this positive relationship again. Uh, and then the other way is literally doing an experiment, kind of like a drug trial, right? So where you have a set of firms, treat part of them to to be better managed, and then uh, compare to a control group um, and of firms that don't get that. And then again, you just see the firms that got the treatment do better. Um, so one of one of the puzzles here, though, is that if if management is so great, right? And um, why are firms not all adopting these magical practices, right? And and it really is a puzzle. Um, especially when when we, we do think that a lot of these things seem to be quite straightforward. So um, we have some data on characteristics that we think might be driving, you know, the adoption of these practices. And I'm going to go over uh, very quickly some, some of these that, that we've uh, collected over the years. Um, first of all, looking at manager, manager perceptions, um, the very last question on, on this interview, now imagine, you know, you're a plant manager, you've been talking about uh, all the practices that you have in your firm for the past hour. The very last question is, how, so excluding yourself, how well managed do you think your firm is? Um, by and large, people rate their firms uh, above average, you know, So and um, and then when we look at, at an average so from a, a country level, some countries have a much larger difference between uh, what we think is, is their, we assess is their quality of management and what their assessment is. So um, one one thing that that's kind of a low hanging fruit here is just kind of understanding, you know, the, the first um, part of, of improving your, your practices would be, of course, knowing that you have to do so. So um, that's that, that's certainly one one of the first steps. Um, and then second, education and skills also um, are quite important. And and that's both for managers and for non managers. Right. So we, one thing we see is. Um, there's a correlation here between the share of managers that have a, uh, a college degree within um, within the firm and the, the quality of management, but also here for non-managers, right? And this has um, implications for how much you know you you want to sort of have the, the the collective skill of your employees within the firm, not just the managers, but everybody in um, uh, taking in and and, and uh, instigating that change or that improvement. Um, ownership also seems to drive a lot of these differences, so. Firms that have um, dispersed shareholders, that meaning meaning not any one owner owns more than 25% of the shares. That's that's the definition we use here. Um, as well as private equity firms seem to have the, the best management um, in their firms. 
Family firms are interesting because um, there's a difference here between family firms that have a professional CEO or an external CEO, non-family CEO in place, and family firms that have a family CEO in place. Um, it's not just family ownership, but it, on those firms that are family owned that have this external CEO seem to adopt many more of these best practices relative to those that are um, led by the family CEO. Um, competition, you know, very much matters. We we see the firms that face higher competition tend to be better managed. You know, they're either forced to do better or or exit. Uh, very much relatedly, firms that face global pressure, like multinationals, they tend to be well managed everywhere. And I think one of them, uh, a couple of really important points that come out of this is, first, it's further evidence, you know, that impact of of competition here. Um, but it's it's something that um, you know, I I am from Brazil. I'm, I'm Brazilian, and I. Um, uh, I've heard a lot in, in the Brazilian interviews, oh, that can't happen here. That's just, you just don't understand our context. And I think what's nice about the when we, what we see from multinationals is that that suggests that's not really true. You know, if there's nothing inherent about many of these countries that uh, doesn't allow firms to take to adopt management best practices, given that the multinationals are able to do it, right? So um, certainly is, is um, uh, an, interesting, an interesting finding from um, that part of the, the survey. Now, the one exception here on, on the government side is that at country level, um, it, there can be real constraints that government regulations can put in. Um, in particular here, what we see is uh, the Employment Rigidity Index. This is an index from the, the World Bank uh, doing business uh, indices. And we see that if, if there's really strong, uh, um, uh, ex rigid labor regulation, it might discourage firms from adopting some of these best practices. So it's in particular here from the people management practices, we see this negative relationship here. Um, okay, so that was a lightning summary of uh, the work we've been doing over, over the 20 years and um, you know some of the key findings we've had over this time. Uh, we have you know on our website, worldmanagementsurvey.org, we have uh, all of the, the background research papers on this as well. That they're all there, but just for, for the purposes of um, going forward, I think we, we really wanna talk about the new stuff we've, we've been working on. Um, since, you know, as we see the world being increasingly messy and then all of the, the new data we collected on um, how firms handle these disruptions in terms of climate change and the supply chain. Um, now, I'll start with, uh, you know, there's this one big shock that um, I'm sure we all still remember, but very much want to forget, which is the, you know, pandemic hit us. And uh, the work that has come out since then um, has shown that firms that, that have better management practices we're much better able to actually cope with that disruption at that time. Um, I'll just show you a couple of things here from colleagues in uh, using data from Italian firms show that firms that had better management practices, this is the top line here, um, had um, a much less, the, the, the lessened the shock to their bottom line here in terms of sales growth um, relative to firms that had worse management. And this is uh, primarily via sort of reorganizing workflow and workers and so on. Um, and then we did a similar exercise in Denmark, um, but there we also found that not only did they have lower um, sort of shock to to the the, the revenue, but they're also more likely to to be able to get aid and engage in you know the the type of uh, programs that were available to firms to to lessen that disruption. And then another issue that was really salient at the time, um, and that links links to our supply chain questions. And so, um, you know, for example, those automakers weren't able to get the chips they needed to sort of finish building their cars. Uh, and at the time, a lot of folks were blaming it on um, just in time and saying, "Oh, lean failed." You know, it's it's not that's uh, not not the the great thing that it seemed to be. But uh, what I, I think is an interesting um, part of this is that one of the champions of lean, which is Toyota. They didn't have the same problem as everybody else. And uh, one of the big reasons for this is that Toyota didn't just implement this one part of good management. They had the whole system in place. And that meant that just in time came with also a strong focus on relational contracts they had with suppliers. They co-locate with suppliers. And so, you know, they they think through um, more than just that one specific uh, point. And so, you know, it's more about good management overall, not just like this one, um, uh, one, one tool. So this time around, we started asking some questions about um, supply chains. So the five things that are new that we asked uh, managers about is, uh, first of all, their supply chain strategy. So um, we started with asking a little bit more generally, you know, do, do you even have a supply chain strategy? Can you tell me a bit more about it? Um, and turns out the majority of firms actually don't have a supply chain strategy or a vision for that in place. Um, about a fifth of them do. Uh, and and see supply chain strategy as as a source of um, long term competitive advantage. 
So that's one clear area of, of improvement, I think that, you know, it's just sitting right there. Um, the second question we asked them is about operationalizing that supply chain um, uh, strategy. And unsurprisingly, given that so many firms don't didn't have a vision or a strategy in the first place, they also didn't um, have uh, much in terms of, of operationalizing it. Uh, but, uh, you know, having sort of a consistent set of indicators to keep track of how things are going. But um, I think you know, about half of the ones that said they did have a, a, this as a source of long-term competitive advantage don't actually have a whole lot of metrics that go with that. So I think that's also um, quite telling. And then third, we wanted to ask, uh, understand their decision-making process. You know, how do they account for supply chain risks? Um, how do they, and how does that feature into the decisions um, uh, that, that they're making? And here's a little bit more balance, right? So we find um, about a third, a third, a third, a little bit, sort of roughly, um, in terms of, of firms engaging in, in thinking about potential risks, scenario planning, um, and, and having analysis tools to kind of include um, these things in, in their supply decisions. About another third, um, you know, identify and think about these risks, but don't really do much in, in the way of actual planning. And then another third just don't really consider risks uh, when making those decisions. And then fourth, we wanted to know about the visibility of the supply chain. Now, end-to-end -end visibility is, is incredibly hard to, to achieve, but almost 40% of firms do have at least tier two supplier visibility. Another quarter have about tier one. Um, and then again, uh, there is this balance of firms here that barely have visibility within their own company. So again, it seems like low-hanging fruit to have at least visibility within, within your own company. Um, and then finally, uh, flexibility. So how flexible or adaptable is um, the, the, the manufacturing process to these issues in, in supply chains? Can they um, uh, you know, shift operations, move materials around, or adapt manufacturing if, if needed? And again, we have this um, similar breakdown here on um, uh, the, the, uh, how well how flexible these uh, these would be. Now, this is all, you know, in itself, I think it was interesting um, uh, document, uh, facts to document. Uh, but as we care about management, we want to know what the relationship between these and management is. And what we see is that better managed firms are more likely to have a strategy in place in, in, um, in first place. They're more likely to monitor that um, properly. Um, they're more likely to have a scenario risk planning as part of their decision making. Um, they're certainly much better in visibility and and also in flexibility. Right? So across the board here, we see this correlation between uh, better practices, um, just management practices in the core set that we measure and these new um, new questions. So, and then the second big disruptive force that that um, we wanted to talk about is climate change. Uh, and so for this, we had three main topics that, that we asked about. First, uh, we started asking just about perceptions, you know, how exposed do uh, managers think that, um, uh, that they, they, uh, their firm is to natural disasters? And then about half say that they de definitely feel exposed. Um, about a, a little over a third to think, no, they're, they're safe. Um, but you know, the majority of managers do feel like there's at least some level of exposure here. But then when we ask about adaptation, you know, do they have any measures in place to uh, respond to these potential disruptions from climate change? It's almost um, the opposite. And only 15% of firms say that they uh, have a range of measures ready to go, and almost 60% of them have nothing or very little uh, in place, which I think, you know, that's quite massive. Um, and it's the same with mitigation, uh, right? So we asked uh, whether they have any measures in place to reduce greenhouse emissions, mitigating pollution. Um, and again, half don't have much going on, only 20% have sort of a range of, of measures in place. And then again, turning back to management, um, you don't need to have good management practices to be aware of your potential exposure, um, but it does seem like having better practices does help you um, engage with adaptation as well as mitigation, um, which um, you know are also quite, quite important. So where does that leave us? Um, so we continue finding this really strong, positive relationship between um, adopting better management practices and a whole bunch of firm outcomes that we really care about. Uh, we know some of the key drivers of good management and, and how firms might improve you know, by themselves. Um, but there's also a lot of space here for government policy to help and, and nudge things along. And now one thing, um, you know, so we are competing with election coverage, as, as John said. Uh, so perhaps, you know, it's a perfect time to highlight how governments can actually help Push, push some of this. Uh, we do have a, a full write-up of this in a, our paper, as I mentioned, in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. Um, but in short, we have two kind of broad 
types of policy that we discussed there. One is a more structural set, um, you know, that that takes a longer and, and you know sometimes is more controversial, um, since you know it includes things like structural change to industries. But there's also these more micro-based policies that that are focusing on more within organization, like incremental change. Um, and uh, again, we have you know, more. This this is one of the, the the exhibits we have in the paper where we talk about uh, each one of these or structural or direct um, type of, um, of policies, and then the strength of the evidence and how much we think the the policy net benefit is. Um, how hard we think it might be to implement and and the time frame there but um and i i think we'll have a bit of discussion on this in uh in the q a so i don't want to uh go too much over my time so um i i'll leave it here looking forward to this discussion and to what um Tara has to say so thanks again for everybody for for coming so thank you very much danny for a real excellent overview and and to keeping on time uh even more importantly um, I, just just to re-echo what uh, Danny was saying, you know, we began this 20 years ago um, with uh, a partnership with uh, McKinsey, so it's very appropriate that Tara is from McKinsey is, rep is going to represent that. I'd, I'd also like to give a, a shout out to um, many of the, back in 2004, um, the partner at McKinsey, John Dowdy, who's been uh, very much inspirational in helping us with this work and, and leading on this work, as well as uh, Stephen Dorgan and, and Tom Tom Rippon, and again to many of the kind of uh, interviewers, including you know, Olivier and others who are in the audience today. So without further ado, let me hand over to Tara to uh, have a somewhat of a response, but also giving her more general thoughts on the uh, on on this area. Over to you, Tara. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jordan. Thank you very much for the presentation, Danny. It's an absolute delight to be here. Um, I genuinely believe that management does matter uh, and it's great to see this new research. It's great to see that we continue to put effort into researching this very important topic. In addition to the things that John already mentioned about me, there are two other things I thought was worth kind of giving you as background so you know where my comments are coming from. So the first one is I'm a trustee at a charity called Be The Business, which is literally founded upon this idea that management matters. Um, and that charity is trying to help small and medium sized businesses to improve their management practices. Um, and that gives us a little bit of insight on what works and what doesn't work uh, in the real world out there. And also, I spent 10 years in government as chief economist in various departments and, of course, productivity and and how we can move the needle on it was very much at the forefront of what we were trying to understand. And I think this research gives us, as, as Danny has just shown, a kind of real interesting angle, both from a macro and micro perspective on what could be done on this incredibly important topic. Um, with that intro, what I wanted to do in my 10 minutes or so is, first of all, just say a few things about the research that I particularly liked. Um, secondly, say a bit about why I think this continues to be so incredibly important as a research theme. Thirdly, say a bit about the limitation, limitations of the research. Um, mostly, I recognize that this is just a very small, narrow sliver that we've looked into and uh, the community out there have done a ton more research around much broader topics. But I do think that we continue to want to expand the way that we look into these management issues and their impact. Um, and indeed the sorts of solutions that might help us. Um, and some, and with, with that, I think there'll also be some kind of questions that arise for, for our Q&A. So first of all, thank you so much, Danny, for, for doing the research, obviously, but also presenting it brilliantly um, and laying out the kind of findings with such, um, um, such a kind of compelling message around this idea that management continues to really matter for productivity and for a lot of other outcomes as well. And as somebody who's worked with businesses, inside businesses, and also as an economist, I think it's just incredibly important that we go beyond the sort of classical way of thinking of the firm as a black box, box that just responds to incentives. Of course, firms do respond to incentives, but we need to be able to look inside that black box to properly understand what's going on. And I think your methodology of interviewing people is really the gold standard in how you elicit structured information from um, a, a not very non-gameable um, source, of, source of data. So um, that's an incredibly good foundation on which to build these research findings. 
I also find that having these international comparisons and characterizations is really, really helpful because it helps to basically give credibility, but also some interpretation to the data and allows us to understand what's specifically strong or weak in different countries and what you might be able to do about that. Um, in your um, sort of research summary paper that you've written, the illustrations of what good and bad looks like are actually super helpful because that kind of bringing it to life helps people in the in the policy world and in businesses to understand that this is not just some academic theoretical exercise over here. This is actually really practical things you could be doing in your business differently. Um, it's not rocket science, basically. Um, and explaining that, I think, is quite important to lower the barrier for people to actually even listen and, and care and take, um, um, you know, pay attention and take action. Um, for individual businesses, I think your methodology is also very valuable because it allows you to benchmark. You know, it, it, well, you, you say, uh, and we'll come back to it, people tend to have not very accurate perceptions of their own performance. And this gives them an objective way of actually measuring what they're doing in a way that's much easier than trying to come up with some trees of KPIs or whatever other things they might want to use to benchmark. And so it's very actionable. Um, and I think this latest wave of research is super interesting in terms of all of those new uh, connections that you're making um, because it's so it becomes, you know, you sort of further, I guess, just embedding the idea that these management practices matter pretty universally across all kinds of countries, across all kinds of businesses. Um, and, the, and there are lots of interesting insights here around, for example, CEOs in family firms, if they're um, basically an external CEO, you, you have better management practices and better productivity. Um, the new work you've done on supply chains and climate change, I think, has value, of course, in those spaces, but has a bigger value, because I think we're starting to get a feeling that there's something really thematic, something systemic, something almost like cultural about these management practices and skills. So businesses that are do well on one axis tend to do well on other axes. And I think understanding why that is could be quite important in moving the needle on, on how um, businesses are managed in each of those each of those different areas and how we can then actually build that up into something that might make a difference at the macro level. So those are all fantastically interesting and valuable insights, I think, that come out of the specific research you've, predict, uh, you've presented today. Um, if I take a little bit of a step back in terms of why this matters so much, um, I wanted to just highlight a few things that are specific to the UK, but I suspect uh, will be going in on other countries as well. I mean, most of you wouldn't be on this call, I suspect, or on this on, on this presentation discussion um, topic today, if you didn't think that productivity is inc incredibly important. Now, we all know productivity growth is required for us to improve living standards. And we also know that it's been pretty rubbish uh, for the last several decades. Um, what's, what's particularly concerning is I remember having conversations in roughly 2019, where we were looking at the previous decades and really um, very disappointed about the 0.6% productivity growth we'd seen in the UK. Now, when we look at the last five years, that's dropped down to 0.4%. So not only are we languishing in terms of productivity growth, but it's getting worse. And of course, some of that is to do with these huge shocks that have hit the economy um, since then. But, but it's nevertheless a very concerning trend. And it's particularly overly concerning when we put that together with what's happening to um, participation rates in the workforce. Um, we've got an aging population. It's not growing very fast, our population. A lot of the growth is coming from migration. Um, and so where are we going to find all these workers to do all the work that still will need to be done, especially for that aging population, but elsewhere in the economy as well? If we don't improve productivity, we are not going to be able to improve output, broadly speaking. And so that's a big concern for anybody concerned about kind of living standards and the economy overall. Um, and even though you might think that all this hype around AI will suddenly give us that amazing productivity boost that we've been looking for, actually the evidence so far isn't very compelling. The, the AI evidence suggests that yes, there's huge potential 
for it to automate whole tasks, probably not whole jobs, and to take the human out of the loop and really drive efficiency gains and the effectiveness gains across a whole number of occupations. But in practice, only about 14% of UK businesses say they have adopted AI. The number is a bit bigger if you ask in a slightly different way. Um, and only 10% of them say they're actually planning to do anything about it in the next three months. So the barriers to adoption are absolutely enormous. And I think, you know, this is something we should come back to when we think about management practices. To what degree do these good management practices also help businesses adopt technology that's productivity enhancing? Because that is where a lot of the gains will come in the future, but they're not going to come unless people actually adopt these practices and adopt technology and redesign their businesses such that they can get those productivity gains out. Um, the, the final thing I wanted to say is um, there are a lot of ways in which these management practices, while they have a direct impact on productivity, they also have an indirect impact, or at least this is my hypothesis, and maybe this is something to test in future uh, research, which is, um, you know, we know that actually the slowdown in productivity growth is mostly to do with capital investment. Uh, it's not because management practices have gotten worse. In fact, they've gotten better. Um, but I have a strong hypothesis that with good management practices comes ambition and comes the willingness and ability to actually invest in the kind of capital you then need to drive productivity and drive improvements in your business. And so these management practices are almost like the, at the core of all kinds of beneficial behavior from firms. And if that's the case, then we need, obviously need to continue to pay a lot of attention to them. Now, what are some of the uh, limitations of the research? Uh, I won't dwell on them, but I'll mention a couple because I think they're important in interpreting what it means for now, but also in thinking about what we might do more in the future. So the first one is the, there's quite a focus on manufacturing. And from a UK perspective, this manufacturing is less than 10% of our economy. So, so we need to be careful about describing how these same findings might um, imply, imply importance in other sectors. Now, we know from other research that, you know, the same story holds. Management practices matter in other sectors as well. Um, but maybe some of the very specifics around how we look at and how we measure management practices can't readily transcribe or, or trans be transported to uh, other sectors. Um, Secondly, and John knows that this is a bit of a bee in my bonnet, um, I love the way that the way we measure management practices here is very actionable. It's very concrete. But I also think it leaves out a bunch of things that are equally important for productivity and performance not, and also well-being of uh, the workforce. And these are what I would call the kind of more psychological or more social or more relational things that happen in the workplace. We know that managers have a huge impact on workers' motivation and the degree to which they are able to be innovative, et cetera, et cetera, not just through these structured practices, but through their behavior in terms of do they are they empathetic, do they listen, do they build trust? Do they build relationships? Do they uh, praise people for small gains? Do they give non-verbal um, non cues about how they appreciate their work? And do they instill a sense of purpose and values? And those are all things that I personally believe, and I've seen the research to suggest are incredibly important for the outcomes we're seeking. And I would hate for people to read this research and kind of go, oh, it's all about these structured management practices. Um, and, and forget that all this other stuff also matters. Um, final limitation I'll mention, and we'll probably get into it in the discussion, is that this research is still almost by definition a couple steps removed from really actionable policy um, levers, especially in that space that Danny talked about in the kind of micro and it's, it's nothing to do with the research itself. It, it wasn't meant to try and find policy solutions, but the real world is challenging out there. So Danny, you mentioned low hanging fruit in terms of getting businesses to realize how bad they are at management. Well, actually it's, the, it's not really low hanging fruit in the sense that it's incredibly hard to get businesses to realize how bad they are. 
Um, we know from more local research here in the UK that it's the worst managed businesses that are the least likely to benchmark their performance, are the least likely to want to ask for external advice. And um, from the experiment that was done in the UK, out of 12,000 businesses that were part of an initial survey, a total of 45 in the end ended up asking for actual mentoring that they were going to get for free. So cracking the demand side problem, as I call it, you know, how do we get businesses to care about this? How do we get them to want to know how good they are? How do we get them to want to improve? How do we get them to want to spend time and effort in, in, to, in improvement of the businesses is harder than you'd think. Um, and while the general economist answer might be, just give them some incentives. Well, they already have an incentive. You know, they would make more money. They would grow more. They would they would do all kinds of good stuff um, if they did uh, uh, adopt these practices. So I think we need to go even deeper into the black box and, and perhaps apply some behavioral economics or behavioral kind of insights into understanding what some of those limitations are. But broadly speaking, I will stop here and just say fantastic piece of work, really delighted that we continue to put effort into understanding management practices because they continue to be incredibly important. Well, thanks, Tara. That was a fantastic discussion. Um, and uh, just, be just before we turn it over to the audience, I'm going to abuse my, <laughs> my chair's prerogative um, and uh, you know, give Danny maybe a chance to respond to some of the uh, questions that Tara raised, particularly over some of the limitations. So lessons for other sectors, leaving out social psychological aspects. What are the act, you know, the, the last one on, I guess, what are the policy levers that if you wanted to do something about this, um, what should the new governments do? I think about the UK case, or you might want to talk about them more widely. What do you think, you raised several things they could do what do you think the priorities, the policy priorities should be of the, of the new government if they if they wanted to to kind of raise management level for sort of thing? So over to you, Danny. Good. Uh, yes, Tara, thank you so much. And I think, uh, you know, we only have a limited amount of time here to have this public discussion, but hopefully you and I can also just sit and chat a lot more about some of the stuff. I am a big fan of the Be The Business um, uh, charity as well. So um I'm going to just try to make a couple of points. Um, first of all, on the um, uh, the other sectors, absolutely. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that has uh, grown as part of this project is that we've applied the concepts and the core concepts of this um, to other sectors. And it has been, I personally was a little shocked at how much it applied to a bunch of other places. I thought, no, schools, you know, this isn't going to work. And it turns out public organizations, a lot of this stuff is just so core um, that I think one of the, my... My child self, uh, when I first started in this project, um, uh, really didn't understand just how much a lot of this core stuff isn't applied, right? And and so when I when I and to, I should say when I say low hanging fruit, um, I, it isn't a comment on how easy it is to apply it, but just how you know base uh, basic really is some of these things. So we've uh, done this in in um, hospitals and schools as kind of a, a, a bigger part of the project, but uh, we're also doing a bunch of other um, um, expansions into different sectors. Like one of the projects we have now is on biomedical labs, right? So thinking about a fundamentally different type of organization, because uh, a lot of the firms and schools, even in hospitals are, are larger, you know, you have 50, 60 um, uh, people, at least to the sort of the lower end. A lot of these labs are small, right? And, and the, the way that the kind of, uh, production happens in these labs is different because it's the kind of people that that are part of this and how it all works with, between five to ten people is fundamentally. So um, you're right, we had to tweak in how we think about management in those settings, but um, but it is something that I think is really exciting to to think about. Um, and you know, also uh, knowledge creation versus just kind of production and um, of widgets, mind you, of whatever it is. Um, I really like your point on. Um, uh, the the worker motivation and how much you know workers are part of that and I think there are frameworks on how we think about changing management and one of the the most important and crucial parts of how to to change organizational practices is how do you solve that sort of within firm political problems of getting workers involved in the change because if you just do this top down you have to do this often it doesn't really change uh, fundamentally and that's one of the things that Toyota is so good at is that you know they do kind of have worker involvement in a lot of those points. 
Um, now the cracking the demand side, I, I do love that part. And, and then I'll get to just my, the couple of thoughts on, on government policy. Um, one of one of the things that I, I have seen a couple, only a few papers on this. Uh, there might you know there might be more of it, but um, I think there's there's the motivation. You're right. There's a lot of incentives that people have incentive. They know that it might be good for them to apply these practices. Sometimes they even know how to do it. Um, but you know we've all got to work at uh, you know seven o'clock in the morning sometimes, and then uh, it's five, and you don't know how you know, the day went and all of the things that you had to do and the fires that you were fighting. And it's, and you can imagine a firm owner or a firm manager coming into work and that being their case. How do you carve out the time to really, you know, put in um, those, those practices and enact that change. And I think that's one of the places that um, both consultants and other, you know, different um, uh, stakeholders might be able to help is carving out that space and helping managers carve out that space. There's um, some research that shows that this, you know, actually having somebody in the the um, establishment with you does help promoting that, um, uh, that to, to actually happen. Now, more broadly in terms of, um, you know, what can government policies, you know, we, we talked about a bunch of them in the, um, in the paper, the, the review of economic policy paper. Um, but I think there's two two main uh, points that are that are really important. I you know I think promoting competition you know there's almost no better incentive to improve than um, actually having uh, competition be uh, uh, having other firms sort of being down your door you know and but it is often hard you know politically not to kind of fold into protectionism um, uh, even though in the you know in the medium to long run it really kind of kneecaps industries at, at the end of the day but. Um, because invariably something is going to happen that's going to expose firms, right? So, so it's just really best to kind of try and promote good fair competition as much as possible. Um, but then also couple that with support for skills to make sure that firms that are sort of at the bottom end of that that would be um, um, exiting the the industry without improving have tools to improve, right? And so we have this uh, both the, the skills and um, um, uh, broadly of of the workforce, but also training specific managers and thing, figuring out what is that way then, uh, as, as Tara said, that are going to get managers to care about it and change um, beyond. So you have the pressure from competition, but then you also give the skills so that it can happen. And it's not just a mess where people are upset that, you know, everything is going wrong. So I will stop myself from continuing uh, letting more <laughs> conversation. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Danny, and again, Tara. So let, let's open it up, and uh, other, you know, other people, uh, put your your virtual hand up if you'd like to ask a question to either either of our, our panelists. Um, so please, uh, anybody who would like to would like to say something, go ahead. Anna, did you have your hand up there? Let's see. Yeah, I, yeah. I had a question. Um, so you have some firms that you've interviewed repeatedly, and obviously within countries now you can see um, kind of trends over time. In general, do you see some countries or some firms, some types of firms that tend to improve, or are there not really clear patterns on that? Because I know also that there might be issues of sample size and having enough to say that within specific categories. Great question. Um, and so I actually did have one graph and I was almost looking, if I had it on the desktop, I would have shared it. But um, where where we do see that on on average, firms are improving. And the ones that we do get to see, and you know, as as you as you mentioned, there are there are issues with which ones are the ones that we're able to actually re-interview. Um, there are a bunch of them that have died in between, right? So firms kind of uh, we we can't find them anymore or that they, they've exited the market. And um obviously we expect those tend to be the ones that were um, worst managed in the first place. Um, but we do see a, a trend towards firms improving. Um, it's not massive improvements. You know, they are still gradual improvements. A lot of those improvements do come about um, when something happened to the firm. So, for example, a family firm decided to hire an executive um, for for their for, as a CEO, or sold the firm, you know, or the private equity got involved, or you know, there's something happened in one of those drivers that that pushed that kind of change to happen. Um, more at the country level, uh, countries that that have gone through some, you know, when competition did open, that improved. We do have some countries that on aggregate have um, uh, gone down. So they have actually decreased the, um, in terms of their their average quality of management. Again, unclear just how much of that is going to be the, a, a sample issue. But um, 
it it's most of the the uh, improvements have happened because something kind of pushed them across um, that boundary and then you you know you see firms in either uh, getting uh, getting better um because somebody came in and did something or because um they were pushed to do so uh, maybe we should have included that in the report maybe we'll we'll do an addendum <laughs> thanks thanks danny um other other questions please put your your hand up. Um, let me see. Um, I think there is. Oh, so, sorry. Yes. I'm not oh, sure how oh, it is, oh. my hand, uh, but if, if it's fine, I'll just ask the couple of questions that I have. Okay, um, Ram, you, you go then, Ben Barthi, I think, afterwards. Go ahead, yeah. Ram. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions and I'm just going to group them together. One is um, what do you think is the impact of uni unionization on these things? Is that something you record in the data and you can see whether firms that are unionized um, or have, have a union, unionized labor force kind of have tend to have better management practices. Um, the second is um, whether you also observe mergers between firms um, and post merger, you know, whether one of the merger efficiencies, efficiencies is that for the merged entity kind of has better management practices than it did before. Um, and so one last one, which is more general is, um, we see now growing protectionism across the world. And, uh, and obviously it's something that impacts competition as well, because firms don't have as much access to global markets as they did before. And is that something you're concerned about uh, in, as something that could impact management practices. So Danny, why don't you answer that? And Tara, if you've got any thoughts also after Danny said, please, please chip in. Yeah, so let me just uh, address the, the, the specific questions on the survey, and then I think the more general points, um, I'm sure Tara has some, some good insights as well. So in terms of uh, unionization, we do actually ask the question of the share of workers that are unionized. Um, in general, what we find is, is there's definitely a negative relationship in terms of the share of the workforce that is unionized and the people management practices. And I think part of that is because there are um, just fundamental um, restrictions that are imposed on what firms can actually adopt. And for example, how to promote people, right? So, and then we see this, especially in other sectors, like um, in education, a lot of the schools that we've interviewed are public schools. Um, and, and, that we, and, you know, and that's a bit of a parallel um, where and the hospitals as well, when they have a large shares of the the workforce unionized, you just can't promote people based on performance, right? Or, or performance is seen as something that's just the number of years that you've been in in place. You, it's harder to um, uh, enact performance improvement plans and things of the sort. And I think, um, you know, so that's that's one really obvious place where unionization does affect um, the ability of of organizations more generally to to adopt some of these things. Um, your second question, uh, your third question was about protectionism, and I'm blanking on what your second question was. Uh, it was on mergers. And... Mergers, mergers, and acquisitions. right. So um, I think there, there were multiple times over the years we've tried to see, uh, you know, I don't think uh, there might have been people who asked for the data to and, and have done work on this. Uh, we, I, you know, I, I, I don't have, um, I don't know that we have quite enough data to put together. I think, um, so... I don't know if John, maybe you, you've seen uh, or you remember other works that were done with mergers and acquisitions here. I think there's you know not not a whole lot within um, our data per se. I think there's a lot of really interesting examples outside of the management um, uh, data in, in particular. Some that I teach in my class in strategy, like uh, you know the Boeing merger that was a complete disaster. Um, and we, and and I think what we can learn from a lot of those things is that it really depends. When you say merger, it depends on whether is it an acquisition or a merger, and, and who's going to sit in the C-suite really matters for setting the culture of the organization. In the case of Boeing, it was disastrous, right? There's other firms that it might have worked really well, um, but certainly um, where that kind of um, set of practices are going to come from and or um, and the uh, it sits at the C-suite when when those things happen, um, and so let, let me let me stop here though because I think the protectionism um, point uh, I'd love to hear more on what um, Tara said because I think I already said uh, a couple of words on that so um, let me let me hand it over. Yeah, of of course, sure. I well, yes, like it is a concern because if you have first of all your consumers are going to pay a higher price for what they could have gotten cheaper from elsewhere and secondly you're going to dampen that incentive or or the kind of competition that in my view is one of the only ways you can kind of 
actually get the lowest performing firms to improve is to kind of basically have them taken over or have them have them squeezed out of the market. We can talk a little bit about what you can do with firms a little bit further up the distribution, which might not be quite so drastic, but I think it's, it, if anything, the, the research we've heard today is that reinforces the importance of competition as a driver of these management practices and hence productivity growth. Um, there are probably things that um, countries that think about this really carefully could do to mitigate uh, some of the negative effects of protectionism on, on the kind of market forces. And they could be things like looking at all the other reasons why competition maybe isn't so effective in that country. You know, is it because of, you know, high entry barriers? Is it because of low information requirements? Is it because customers are not, you know, as well informed or whatever it is? Um, so I guess there was something else Danny said earlier, which has prompted this idea uh, that generally when people are putting in policies for let's call it political reasons that we know might have some negative consequences economically or socially you know why not think of a package of measures um which might then mitigate some of those other other things no it's not going to be first pest but we never we're never in a first best world anyways um we start with the policies we have and so that's how we would how I would think about it, you know, think if you are going to be protectionist for for certain reasons, then think about all the consequences and think about ways in which you can mitigate those consequences elsewhere in the economy. Um, Barthi, I think you had you've been patiently asked most of the question. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I've been working on I work as an economist at this Chartered Management Institute, just um, for a bit of an introduction. Um, and we've authored um, a report called Management in UK 2030. Um, and we've tried to better understand what is required to improve management practices and management capability in the UK and explored some policy recommendations. And I just sort of wanted to better understand what your thoughts were on some of them, especially two key ones. So the first one is something which Terra, I think you touched upon was um, trying to stimulate the demand um, of employers um, to demand uh, employment training or uh, sorry, management training or better management practices. Um, and one thing we sort of uh, explored was, I think it came from John, one of your research papers was uh, the assurance of long term employment, for example, in Germany, which has led to um, reducing the risk of losing returns on investment for employers. So, you know, in Germany, employers tend to have long term assurance that, OK, I'm going to invest in this employee and they're going to be with me um, for at least five to ten years. So is that what are your sort of thoughts on that for the UK uh, labour market? Um, and secondly, um, one thing that we had to look at ourselves was the tax treatment of skills. Um, so, of course, training in the UK tends to be fully expensable. But in terms of um, its treatment on businesses' accounts, um, it tends not to add value to the business, whereas capital investments tend to add value to the business. They become an asset, whereas an employee that is trained up is mobile. You know, they can move. So what are your thoughts on that? Any ideas of how that can be um, thanks, thanks you know, very circumvented? Much, I think we've only got one minute left. <laughs> so oh, Danny, dear. OK, go uh, for it. Do you want to uh, give uh, give give an, uh, a brief answer to those those two extremely good questions? Again, Danny, you're muted. Oh, I was just gonna. I thought you said Tara. Um, since oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very I, happy to respond, yes. John, okay. and Barton maybe online <laughs> as well. So okay, first seconds, of all, 60, okay, go I'm, ahead, Tara. Yeah, very quickly. I think it would be it would be risky to change uh, the flexibility of our labour market. 75% of training interventions are positive net present value, even if the person leaves afterwards. And so that's the message we need to get across to businesses. And on the taxation of training, maybe that would be a kind of blunt instrument for what I think is a much more granular problem. So I would suggest that more thought required. Danny, do you have any, any thoughts? No, I think... I I don't want us to go um, too far over, and I I completely agree. It just my my thought is a plus one on Tara. It's exactly what okay. You're well, thank you both, Danny and Tara, for fantastic presentations, and thank you very much to all the audience for a, a, a great questions too. I'm sorry we have to end it there.
Uh, we could carry on for a long time, I think, but um, please do uh, send in more questions if you have them um, to to um, to me and and the rest of the rest of the team. And just last, thanks very much to to a great session. I'll do I'll do my actual clapping, and people can do real virtual clapping. <laughs>